You're listening to Milwaukee Mafia, your podcast dose of Wisconsin Mafia and true crime history. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Milwaukee Mafia. I'm Eric. I'm Gavin. And Gavin, feels like we it's been a while since we did this, but it probably hasn't, huh? It might have been a little bit. But what do you got for us today? Well, I'll tell you what. I got uh, the first of uh, what's going to basically be a two-parter. So, uh, how about that? Okay. And as you can see, I've got 50 pages here with me. So, so everybody, wow, I, everybody strap in. Yeah, it's going to be a long one. <laughs> everybody strap in. i got 50 pages here. Uh, no, I'm actually not even going to use my notes. Yeah, Gavin Gavin decided that we, he was going to just see if, if he could run a podcast longer than the hard drive on my computer. Yeah. So No, I I'm not going to do that. So um <laughs> actually where we're at today on our timeline is we're up to December 1959 and this coincides with the book that I'm finishing up right now. As as of this recording, I have my next book due in a month. So, uh finishing that up, this is a story from the upcoming book. For some reason, I was thinking the upcoming book didn't really have mafia connections. I must be wrong on that. You are wrong. Oh sir. yeah, that's right. the The current book is the uh, prostitution yes. story, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's right. So all, all right. right, yeah. So today's the first half of the story. Today's story, not strong mafia stuff, but it'll be more obvious why it's part of the story maybe next time. But either way. So this is the story of uh, Chris Caligaro or Christina Caligaro, and somebody somebody can email me and tell me I'm saying her last name wrong because maybe I am I don't know but but I'm gonna say it Caligaro is is this person a stripper that was from like Hurley or something and then moved down to or am I in the complete wrong story? You're totally on on track here. Okay, <laughs> you're totally on track. This person is a stripper. They did dance in Hurley. So, but I mean, every stripper danced in Hurley, yes. right? Every Wisconsin stripper. <laughs> yeah, but that's, you You are not wrong. <laughs> so yeah, so she uh, grew up around Peoria, Illinois, and had a very rough childhood. I mean, uh, I won't even say on here how rough it was. You can wait for the book, because it's, it's bad. And uh, she was in and out of like mental health care throughout her childhood and already at 14 years old she married her first husband wow yeah and uh and what where what year are we in uh well so this would have been i think i think the marriage would have been like 1951 somewhere like that and which probably still crazy young to be marrying somebody but oh totally but, it but totally I mean, is but i mean it's being that it's the 50s, people were getting married earlier right. at that point in time, so it's not probably... Right, and I haven't personally verified this, but I've had somebody tell me that at that point in time, you'd still need a parent to sign off on it. Like, you couldn't just get married right. at 14. So there was some standards, but I don't know why a parent would sign off on that either, but whatever. So she marries this guy, they have a few kids... He, I don't know if he's that bad of a guy, but his friends are some bad people. Like they're all in in gangs and they're burglarizing houses and and robbing liquor stores and and this and getting in fights, doing all the all the middle aged white gang member <laughs> stuff you would do in the fifties. Because picture picture the nineteen fifty a nineteen fifties gang is like the movie Grease. <laughs> you know, it's like that. So different kind of thing. So she's in that. They ended up um, getting divorced. She marries a second guy who is a pimp, and not the best choice. In husbands. not the best choice. So already by the time she's old enough to be a dancer, she's traveling around Illinois and Wisconsin dancing, and after hours doing things that are not dancing, uh, or at least not that kind of dancing. dancing. Yeah. <laughs> Enough said. So she's with that guy for a while and then gets divorced. Then one day she's dancing in Hurley, Wisconsin. So you called that. <laughs> and she meets a guy named Floyd Car Caligaro. So she ends up uh, meeting him and he is alleged to be a pimp. Okay. <laughs> wow. She's She's got a taste though. A yeah. clear taste. Yeah. <laughs> so they end up getting married after a while. They 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 tell people they're married early on, 
um, for a reason that I think is kind of strange. Like she didn't want her parents to disapprove of them living together. So she told them that they got married, um, which, you know, I get that, but like, but she's on her third husband, so like I don't think they're that concerned at this point. But whatever, that's and, what she says. And she is a stripper and a hooker. Well, I don't, I don't know if they know the hooker the part, part, but yeah, but I mean, they're de- they definitely know she's she's a stripper though. And I would assume, like you said, she had a really rough childhood. I would assume that her parents were not top shelf people. Yeah, so her her birth parents divorced when she was young, and her stepfather was just a terrible person again i'm not going to get into it because it's not good but not not a great person and i'm not sure where the mother was i mean the mother was there in the house but i don't know if she you know was trying to protect her daughter from the stepfather or if she was one of these parents who was just like whatever i don't know so but whatever the case is yeah not not a great growing up period Mm -hmm. so okay So she's got three young children. She's on her third husband, who may or may not be a pimp. She's friends with all these questionable characters because of her first husband. She's still friends with a lot of these people. And so she gets a job. The the guy who books her is a guy named Charlie Fox. He's a talent agent. And I would love to know more about Charlie Fox. Because as far as I can tell, he books dancers in nightclubs. And then he gets a percentage of their wages for booking them. There's no evidence that I'm able to find that he's, you know, a questionable guy. But I also find it very hard to believe that he doesn't know what some of these dancers are doing. I could be wrong, but I get that impression. So he books her at the Brass Rail in Milwaukee. And the Brass Rail is kind of, it's not quite a mob place. But it's it's shady. It's got some shady connections. Um, it's run by a guy named Izzy. And Izzy previously ran the Brass Rail as a jazz club. But then somewhere along the way, he realizes that it's more profitable to have dancers. So they would, they would phase it out. First, it would be just jazz club. Then it would be jazz music with strippers. And then eventually just strippers. Didn't we do an episode about this? We may have we may have talked about it a little bit. Yeah, I think so because this sounds strange. Well, maybe we covered this when because didn't we do something with just kind of a preview to your book at one point? In time? We did, we uh, did. So that may be that. So she's dancing there. Um, she also for for a while dances at the Melody Room in Milwaukee, which is owned by Frank Balistrieri, the Milwaukee mob boss. Yep. So, oh, actually, she's not quite the mob bust yet at this point, but he's a top mob guy. So she's in these places. She also, while dancing at these places, ends up having an affair with another bar owner in town. And this is really hard for me to tell exactly from, from like, the police files because she talks about it as, like, an affair. But every time she meets this guy, he's paying her. And they're doing things. So, like, I don't know if this was, like, they're actually dating or if he just had, like, a long-term, Term. like, this is this is going to be the hooker that I go to. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. And then, apparently, she kept raising her rates on him and eventually said, I'm done with you, but you got to pay me this much money or I'll tell your wife. <laughs> um, so, so he paid because, you know, that's what you do. <laughs> and so uh so that's fine uh his name was bill kodrick by the way so if anybody wants to know bill kodrick was cheating on his wife with a hooker <laughs> uh he's dead now so i can say that um is his wife though oh i don't know probably <laughs> i mean this is the 50s she's yeah. probably yeah <laughs> so this is all going on she's her contract is running out in milwaukee so she needs to get another contract so she gets a contract back in peoria where she's from and she gets a contract there uh, to work for a guy named Jimmy Shepard. And Jimmy Shepard is a former boxer. He's got a long criminal record. He also used to be a pimp. There's pimps everywhere. <laughs> and so, you know, he's a shady guy running a, a nightclub with strippers. And she goes to her job there. And when she shows up, he recognizes her. And he's pissed because she had worked for him in the past under a different name because I don't know if people know this but strippers don't use their, their real, real names, names. <laughs> so she was using a different name 
And then he sees her. He's like, wait a second. I fired you. <laughs> um, Just for clarification, you may have said this, but okay. is, he, is she still married to mm-hmm. wife or husband number three? At She's married to husband number three. Okay. Yes. Who might be a pimp. Who might be a pimp. He's okay. alleged to be a pimp because he brings girls between Hurley and... And Milwaukee and Peoria, he dry he gives girls rides, which may not mean anything, but they suspected that he was bringing them around for you know, you know. <laughs> so, all right. So she, the guy's like, okay, you can't work here. I, you're terrible. Um, and then her friend, who's also working that night, her name is Peaches, and Peaches is like, well, if you're kicking her out, I'm leaving too. So they leave, and she calls. Uh, Christina calls her husband, husband number three, who's back up in Hurley. Okay. He, he he brought her down to Peoria, and then he went back up to Hurley because that's where he's from originally. That's where his family is. And she calls him. She's like, "Didn't work out. You got to come back and get me." And he's like, uh, "I don't got enough money right now. <laughs> that's a long drive. Uh, I can't. I'll see what I can do. It might be a few days." She's like, "Okay." So but he ends up, he finds a way to get down to where he ends up selling like a shotgun and some other stuff to to raise enough money for the gas. So he ends up working his way down. That night, she's had a bad day. So her and Peaches and some other people go bar hopping. And I don't know what Peoria is like in the 1950s, but they start bar hopping at 9 o'clock and they continue bar hopping until 4 in the morning. Uh, so apparently, like closing time is a different situation <laughs> yeah. there. So yeah, so they're they're going, and then at four in the morning, after all this bar hopping, she meets a guy at the at the final place, well at least her final place, and she leaves with him. And everybody there that she's with assumes like, oh, she's gonna go with him for like fifteen minutes, and she'll be back. Again, I'm not saying what, but <laughs> you know, you know, mm-hmm. but she doesn't come back. And they continue bar hopping until breakfast time, and they go up for breakfast, and they expect her to come back, and she doesn't come back. And about, like, the when the sun's coming up, her husband makes it down to Peoria. It takes him all night to get from Hurley to Peoria. Uh, for people who don't know, like, Hurley is on the upper Michigan border, and Peoria is, like, central Illinois. No. So it's a heck of a drive. Right, yeah. <laughs> but he's going all night long, and he gets down there. He finds her car parked in the bar. Um, she's not there. He's asking around. People are like, oh, yeah, she was here earlier. And he's like, okay. So he's trying to find where she went. Eventually, he he goes around to enough bars, and he goes and he finds Jimmy Shepard, the guy who fired her earlier, well, the night before. And Jimmy's like, you're her husband? And he's like, yeah. And he goes, hold on. I think there's somebody looking for you. So he calls. So Jimmy calls up, and then a few minutes later, the police arrive. And it turns out that about an hour earlier, her body was found on the side of the road outside of the city limits. And, you know, they don't know who did it. So they're like, it's probably the husband. Because, you know, it's always the, it's husband. the husband. Yeah, even yeah. though he's, he's, what, almost one and a half full states away when this probably right. happened. Right. <laughs> so they come in and they and they question him. And, uh, and actually, the... It seems like it's pretty quick that they're convinced that he has he can cover where he is because, you know, he had to stop for gas and things like that. So they, they knew kind of where he was at different points. And they go around and they ask everybody. And everybody's kind of in agreement about what went on that night and who the guy she left with was. Except nobody knew the guy she left with. They could describe him, but nobody knew who he was. So it kicked off this big, long investigation of who is this guy she left with? Whether he's the killer or not, he's the last one we know who no, saw her. Yeah, I mean, a good lead. Yeah, at at, at a bare minimum. Yeah. So. so, so that's where this mystery takes off. She's outside of the city limits. She's dead on the side of the road. She's been shot, and they don't know who did it. Okay. That's that's my whole rundown. So, if you want to jump in at this point, well, the first question I want to have, and you probably don't know the answer to this, and it's okay. kind of off subject. Sure. But uh, I'm just. I'm I'm just curious. Uh, do you know? Is there some sort of like thing with Peoria? Because why is there a man that runs girls from Hurley and you said to Milwaukee and to Peoria? Mm-hmm. Like like I don't know. It's like Peoria, like a like a factory of 
strippers or something or is there is there something significant about peoria like if i go there is there just a ton of strip clubs or something that would or there there was in the 50s there was yeah i mean i don't know i don't know enough about illinois in the 50s to know if it was like unusual but there was definitely there were a lot of strip clubs and and like and that's that was what surprised me is they would be called nightclubs, but then like in the in the newspaper they would say that they have striptease shows. And I actually was surprised they used that term. I was like in the fifties calling it a striptease show, because like maybe this is me being ignorant, but I'm like thinking, you know, like strip clubs in the fifties. That's not a thing. I mean, it, obviously it was, but like I don't think of that as like a thing. I don't think of like my grandfather going to strip clubs. Mm-hmm. But there was that, and even like the ads in the newspapers. It's exactly like the stereotype. It says like girls, girls, girls. <laughs> and I was like, oh my goodness. But yeah, there seemed like there was a whole lot of nightclubs with strip club acts there, or not strip club, you know, whatever, with stripping acts there. And then also in East St. Louis. It seemed like those were like the two big areas for that sort of thing. I, I, I would love to there there has to be a reason why, and I would love to know that. Yeah, reason, I don't know. You know, because like take it to Hurley, like if for anybody that has not been to Hurley, which I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to this podcast that hasn't, you go down Hurley as a town of almost nobody. Yeah. But you go downtown and there's like, what, a street of like seven strip clubs in a row, basically. Yeah, I and, guess. I, I have not been to Hurley in a long time. But. Oh, well, I've been there not really recently, but recently enough. Oh, and, yeah? You've and, been hanging yeah. on Hurley, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I I went to the strip clubs too. Oh, but okay. but but it wasn't during the right season, so they weren't all open. Oh, it wasn't hunting season. It, it wasn't. It wasn't snowmobiling season. Oh, snowmobiling that, season. That's where they. I see. That's where it really takes off. But but there, you know, you see that in Hurley, and you're like, why would there be this many strip clubs? But then yeah. you find out huge for snowmobiling. Apparently, the city on the other side of the border in Iron Mountain or mm-hmm. in Ironwood, or in, yeah, Ironwood yeah. in Upper Michigan, they do not allow strip clubs at all so that okay. brings people across and things like that so there's a lot of reasons for it to be there and i was just wondering if peoria had some other story i don't know too. i don't know but like the hurley thing is amazing like so in the in the forthcoming book i i spend a lot of time talking about hurley mm-hmm. and um like they have this reputation and they've had this reputation like in the 1800s they had this reputation because originally it was like a mining town hundreds if not thousands of miners moved there and you know they don't come with their families so then all these places spring up and i I don't even know if they even disguised themselves at strip clubs i think they were pretty open about what they were and it just continued on like year after year Year after year. year i mean when the mining dried up then there was other reasons like hurley's always had that yeah and it's so weird but yeah a big part of that why there even originally was because of Ironwood, like because they're both they're both mining towns. But Ironwood back in those days uh, had I don't know about their strip club laws, but they had really strict drinking laws. So so all the bars were on the other side of the border. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, literally, if I remember it right, where everything is in Hurley, it's like the road that crosses it to is. Ironwood. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, there's there's a there's a bridge that connects the two and on both sides of the bridge it's called Silver Street. Yep. And and yeah, traditionally like the first two or three blocks in Hurley and Silver Street, I don't know about strip clubs, but at least all bars. Every yep. single I mean there's more bars than people in this town. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> so a little history on, on Hurley. Yeah. So if 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 you're into that kind of thing Cruise on up there. It's it's oh, perfect. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, and, and they're not shy about it either. Like they know. Yeah. You know, like some cities like they they don't like to be proud of some of that stuff. Hurley doesn't care. They know. No. They know. And and why shouldn't they? I mean yeah. they have no reason to have that and yet they've made it successful. Yeah. So I mean I, I think that's kind of a feat in my eyes. Yeah. So um can you kind of give us a preview of where this story is gonna go now? Sure. So for like the second part. Yeah, know? for the second part. Okay. So for the second part, uh, I don't know how much I want to give away, but somebody else who I mentioned in this part is going to be murdered less than a month after she was murdered. So and there's a second person 
who I already mentioned. And it's going to be the husband. Is it going to be the husband? I don't know, but that's my prediction. It could be the husband, I won't say. (laughs) But I will say the second part happens in Milwaukee. So it comes back with a stronger Milwaukee connection next time. Cool. Well, I guess we're just going to have to wait for part two to find out more. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of questions for this story. This story was pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah. This one, I mean, there's like, there's no way that that whoever the killer was, and we still to this day don't know, but like, it was not a mob murder. It was. I mean, I'll be very upfront about that. It was not a mob murder, <laughs> but it's still an important part of it just because of how closely it ties to the second part. Yeah, and I'm afraid to ask many questions because I don't want to give anything up. I don't want to steer it to a place where you have to give up stuff for the next episode. Okay. So I think we'll just wrap this one up and we'll keep it for part two. Yeah. And we can hit well, you Well, this whole the... thing was just an appetizer then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that was a quick one. Yeah. And we, as it always... It goes faster when I don't have any notes. <laughs> I mean, I do, I have, I actually do have my notes here, but I don't need them because I've been actively working on it so much lately and i should say that you do actually literally have 50 pages yeah is that like direct actually taken from your book yeah i have yeah for everybody who can see here with our no camera podcast (laughs) i have a pile of pages that i'm editing out of out of the book right now with me so yeah i actually have part of the book sitting in front of me cool all right well hang tight everybody and we'll be back in two weeks with part two um just as a friendly reminder if you want an episode next week we do have a patreon go to milwaukeemafia.com find that patreon link click on it and subscribe you get an extra episode every week and they're pretty fun because it's more or less of us me and gavin doing pretty much just whatever we want yeah it's they're they're pretty fun they sometimes they're about milwaukee sometimes they're about mafia sometimes they're very loosely connected (laughs) Connected. (laughs) you never know what's going to happen on that and and it's more laid back so if you if you like just hearing us chat about random crap i mean it's it's a good time yeah so definitely check that out and we will be back in two weeks with part two of this story thanks for tuning in thank you thanks for tuning in to the milwaukee mafia podcast join us next time for another look back at Wisconsin Mafia and True Crime History.